All right, part two of our open heart is the uh, fluid management. So a lot of medical centers, they're actually very sensitive with uh, how we're managing their fluids, right? So I recommend to ask your cardiothoracic surgeon or the CV surgery team before they leave the hospital, what do they want? You know, do they want him on the dry side or what would be your options if you feel like they're dry? All right, fluid management. So I think my point here is if, if I'm going to ask you, what's going to happen if I'm going to give you, uh, let's say, blah, oh, one liter of saline, right? Because I normally ask that question to the nurses and and then they said, what happened? Oh, increased volume. And I was like, how? Then crickets. No one knows how. So let me tell you guys. So when we're volusing our patient, our goal is to really increase the plasma volume. So about 25% will go to plasma and 75% will go to interstitial volume. So that is the point there. You give me one liter of saline, I will augment 25% of my plasma level and 75% of my interstitial volume. Interstitial volume, right? So let's put this into numbers. So plasma is probably 275, right? And then uh, ML and then um, interstitials 825 ML. So when you add this up, 10, carry 1, 9, 10, carry 1, 11. Hey, I only gave him one liter. How come that I was able to create 1100? So that's the beauty of that, that I want you guys to understand because what happened there is from the intracellular compartment, right? Intracellular compartment and extracellular, you pull 100 ml out from the intra to extracellular. That made your interstitial volume go up a little bit. So I hope that this helps you guys, but that's the how of I was referring to why do we always say how. All right, so again, lactated ringer, you probably, I think this is where the hospital where I came from, we only want 500 ml of LR. Um, the doctor still wants albumin, um, either 50 or the 250 ml. They still using uh, had a starch, but you know, I probably will check that with your institution, your organization, because there's a lot of research out there now that says don't use had starch, either pulmonary edema or bleeding, right? But it works by restoring blood plasma loss. So again, that 25%, if you lost a lot of blood, um, that's probably going to help you. All right, and then it contains electrolyte. But where I work now, we use plasma light. So I think that's better than the, you know, the pH is actually better. pH. And then albumin, it's blood and colloid are superior to hypotonic. So it says here, or even isotonic crystalline solution. Again, it's more of expanders. 5% uh, of albumin will provide that um, volume expansion. It even used the word excellent. So it's probably good, right? So how many of you use your albumin? Again, these are your choices, right? Your LR, your blood, your albumin. Uh, Heta starts. Hespan or HES, you have 6% Heta starts in saline, just in case you don't know this. But you don't even have to know if you don't use it, right? But some hospitals are still using Hespan. Uh, it minimized bleeding when given at a 20 ml per k. Avoid if the patient is bleeding and requires volume. 
it excreted in the urine and used cautiously in patient with pre-existing renal dysfunction. So again, there are some um, <clears throat> limitation to the use of HESPAN. So these are your blue volume replacement. Um, if you're giving a fresh frozen plasma, there's about 168 of sodium in there, chloride 76. Your oncotic pressure is 21. Your osmolarity is 300. So how do we get osmolarity? You double your sodium, right? So if your sodium is 135, then double it. It, it is 275. Am I right? 135. Double it, right? Then 70 to 70. So that's pretty much where your osmolarity. Um, dextran, dextran, at the starts, so albumin. So these are just your volume replacement. Again, just go by what you guys are using. So your goal there is to maintain an actual adequate or adequate intravascular volume. Right, to ensure a satisfactory cardiac output and tissue perfusion. And your cardiopulmonary bypass could cause systemic inflammation response, and it will increase membrane permeability and transient capillary leak. That's why they, they end up like getting edema sometimes, swollen, right, because of that capillary leaks. And, um, and I think um, check your... Sp pre-albumin level too sometimes. I think it won't hurt. So after 1.5 to 2 liters of fluid given an alpha agent such as your knee or levo, you should be using it too after. So I think it was just telling us that, hey, did you give me a volume? If the answer is yes, good. If the blood pressure is still low, then it's time to, the tank is full, then we need some support, right? Your Libo or LibaFed or Neo. Some hospitals are still using Neo. If cardiac output and urine output is marginal after fluid administration, that's when you say inotropic support should be considered. So again, guys, do not start until you talk to your team, okay? If you have it already ongoing, then that's good. But if you just got this guy and you don't have that yet, blood pressure has been okay, then you have to consult your 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 team. Diuresis are best avoided. Uh, some doctors they don't want to diurese them for the first six hours, um, unless inexplicable oliguria or pulmonary edema. Right, so you should know what's pulmonary edema. So again, guys, look at your PAP, your pulmonary artery pressure in your on your monitor, and of course your your X ray. Look at your X ray. So some electrolyte placement, your potassium, your mag, and your calcium. So make sure that you check your labs. All right. Epicardial pacing. So epicardial pacing. Your patient will come out with pacer wires, right? So I think I mentioned that in the beginning of the video that you have your positive and the negative. So the indication for use is, again, sometimes they will leave it as a backup. Um, it's not connected. Sometimes it's connected. Um, then if it's connected, then you just have to watch your patient. If he, she or he is 100% pace, and once in a while you probably um, check for underlying rhythms. So I would not do that if I'm 100% pace and D DOO, right? So if you are already on max, like for example, heart rate is max, um, a output is max, V output is max, then 100% pace, don't do it. Let the doctor do it for you. Because once you turn those down, you might not get able to get it back. <laughs> and that's the scary part of it. Because the heart, probably the, you have some issues of myocardial stunning, yeah, or hypokinesia. So, assistly, again, guys, these are just my safety recommendation. I seen nurses independently checking this and they end up getting somebody and then we end up getting calling a code because no matter what we do we even go back to like the same settings the heart the heart or the patient did not even respond after that
So that's just the reason why I share it with you because I experience it. I, it's not me personally, but I was there watching it because they asked my opinion too. And since then, that was many, many years ago, since then I told them, if you are, you know, if you're suspecting that this patient doesn't have any um, intrinsic at all, you know, like the heart is not doing anything good and you're maxed with your pacemaker settings, call the doctor, they do it for you. All right, well... Might as well just leave it like that until the next rounds, right? But if you have, if they told you, then you have to make sure that that is actually on in the order. It's just for my um, probably this is just my recommendation because I have seen how nurses left the bedside because of those. Um, <clears throat> you know, they get written up. So asystole, bradycardia, atrial rhythms like AFib, junctional rhythm. Or just to increase your cardiac output, okay? So those are your uses. Again, guys, your the one that comes from the right side, normally the atria, and then the one that comes from the left side, normally the ventricle. So they don't have, if they don't have any labels, those are atria, these are ventricles, all right? That's how the doctor are trying to put them out there in the on the chest. So your VVI AAI um, is your ventricle. Your VVI ventricle is split, pace. Ventricle is sense. So I hope that you should have a very good understanding of your EKG. Okay. And then your DDD. So again, these are your temporary pacing modes. So indication again, sinus bradycardia, suppression of premature ventricular contraction. Sometimes we do the, the rapid atrial pace when they are to just, you know, terminate the reentrant circuit. So how do you do that? Is you go to your you go to your pacemaker and then you go and trying to um there is that rapid A pace in there. Okay, you just have to click that and then keep pressing it until it terminates. If you're not sure what to do, you should get your nurse educator on how you to teach on how to teach that. Because I, I actually taught that on on my training with my nurses, and we did it hands on. We have a checklist that we followed, and then we have a situation that a scenario that we followed, so they were able to actually do it. All right. So the next one is ventricular pace. So as a manager, I get all these texts even the weekend. So pardon me, let me just read this text because sometimes if they text me like this, I have an emergency. So, so far it's not an emergency, so let's go back. So when you're not capturing, so what's wrong with the picture? Look, this is a B pace, right? How do I know? Because the spikes and then the QRS, spikes but no QRS. So spikes, but no QRS. Spikes with QRS. Spikes, patient spikes, no QRS. So this is your non-capture, failure to capture. Okay. So correction, you increase the output. What do I mean by that? Well, look at this, guys. Um, the output is, you know, when you play with your your pacemaker i don't have it with me here but i think that's something that you will physically look at your pacemaker and all you can do is you know um go back to zero and restart all over again and then go back go up 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 and then when you see a, a pacemaker beats go up a little bit more oh no when you, when you went up let's just say you are at two and you see this, right? And you go to 1.8 and you lost it. Go back to 2. That is your threshold. You double that to 4. So that from 2 to 4, you will able to capture this. So it's like sending more guards or soldier. You know what I mean? If you only send 50 soldiers to capture the, uh, the head of the, the gang, or the leader of the gang, then the tendency is he might escape. But if you send 200, there's no way for him to escape, right? 
So that's just my analogy. So again, that is your uh, capturing, okay? So under sensing, so again, the sensing is what I always use. Like if this is your, uh, let's just say this is your, your rhythm, right? And the fence, right, is this. If this is your fence, that's good because you can see your R, right? So that's how your sensing is supposed to be. So if your fence is really high, then you don't see it, right? So how do we do this? So when you are here, let's just say this is 2, where you saw the middle or the half of the, the rhythm, then you are actually... Um, you're actually safer if you half that to one. Double it, you know, cut it into half. So two, the half of two is one. So that means very low here, right? You're probably on this area. So chances are you have a better view of seeing the rhythms. So that's just, so again, causes of under sensing, it changes the threshold due to ongoing infarction, edema, drugs, a break in the, or disconnection in the lead wire, or there's a dislodgement. So the danger of under sensing, it may spike during the vulnerable period. So what is that vulnerable period? That's what we call relative, relative and not absolute period, right? So in the action potential this part here this is what we call absolute refractory so that means no matter what you do you're not gonna touch me because I'm gonna contract but then this area after that area is what we call um, relative refractory relative means that any strong stimulation this can actually get stimulated and get triggered. So this is your R on T phenomenon, right? So that's why we don't want those. So that's what it means. Um, there's a vulnerable period on the T wave and cause VTAC or VFib. So you don't want that. So that's why you better watch when you're trying to face them or if you're under sensing, okay? So increase sensing ability of the pacemaker until the pacemaker no longer spikes inappropriately. So you go, you increase, it says when you increase the sensing, the lower the number, the more sensitive you are. The higher the number, the less sensitive you are. Okay. So again, this one is under sensing. It didn't see, it didn't sense it. Over sensing, when you are too low, very low, so go up a little bit. All electrical equipment are properly grounded because sometimes those T wave can be an R. You know, remember if this is your P, Q, R, Q, R, S, and then T, right? So sometimes um, the Q, R, S, the T is if it's too high, especially large T wave, then it can count as a P wave. Then it will fire as a P wave. So those are the things that I want you guys to pay attention. Complications. Bleeding. So how many of you already saw bleeding? So question, you have a chest tube. First 10 minutes, you ask somebody to help you to turn your patient. You turn your patient left. On his left, it dumps 200 blood into the chest tube. Is that, blood? Is that abnormal? Do you need to call the doctor? No. Don't call the doctor because that's just your first turn, right? That's just those blood came from OR. However, after one hour, you turn me again to my other side, uh, right side this time, and I give you 200. Yes, call the doctor. It's bleeding. You should not be jump, dumping more than, you know, like more than 50 or 100 in one hour. So these are the things that you need to look for your H and H again, check your chest tube, check everything, your hemodynamics, and then call the doctor because you need to stop the bleeding. Either they go back or, you know, I hate to say it, but some doctors don't want to take them back to re-explore. They're just going to give you something to stop them 
from bleeding, like five or seven, and then you end up like losing all the you know the grabs, right? So um, best way is to really monitor your patient. They take him back. Um, surgical, they would just look at the anastomosis leak, or is there anything that they? Uh, but if they suspect that no, it's not. It's not the surgery. It's just him because of the cardiopulmonary bypass. Then those are your coag panel, right? They have to look for your coag, your um, what's your INR, what's your platelet, those kind of things. PT, PTT. So that's when and tag. I think um, some hospitals are doing tag, uh, and even my hospital now we're doing tag. So that's something that you need to understand how to read the tag, okay? So uh, you're, when you're warming your patient, they're going to start bleeding because now they're vasodilation, right? So replacement of blood, uh, reversal of coagulopathy like your FFP platelets and cryo, some medications like calcium, protein sulfate, or as an heparin antagonist, uh, we don't use Amicar, DDABP, or better yet, surgical re-exploration. Hem hemothorax, <clears throat> okay? So if there is like blood into the lungs, so make sure that, um, check that. And actually, um, cardiac tamponade. So hemothorax, you do an x-ray, Dysrhythmias, such as your AFib, heart block, junctional, asystole, well, check your pulses, and then do ACLS. I don't, I, I normally don't see sil silothorax or chylopericardium. It's just those pus, I think. Lymphatic fluids into the fluoral. So again, guys, depending on what you see, um, with your patient. So watershed stroke. So neurologic um, stroke, right? On pump, uh, there is a neurologic decline. There's some debris or a micro, air microemboli. So we call it watershed strokes. Um, it's really hard to diagnose if you don't do sedation vacation or wake up your patient, let them squeeze your hands, raise their arm, their legs, wiggle their legs. This is a way of saying that they have a movement down there. Check their pupils also. Bolic stroke. Um, decreased concentration, memory, and learning unless they're hard of hearing, right? So make sure you check that. If they're hard of hearing, give, uh, ask their family members to bring or check where they left his hearing aid. If he has some paraplegia in the past, then that's something that you should know so you won't be triggering that as a stroke. And of course, your AFib, control your AFib. Pulmonary embolism, there's a blockage in the pulmonary artery. Um, again, guys, um, I'm not sure if this is a common thing, but I haven't really seen them. But it says here it's more common um, when you got when you're on off off pump. So that means there's no um, bypass, you know machine you're not connected to any bypass machine so you get more pulmonary embolism and a greater risk of dvt would you imagine if you have a dvt or you know diff main thrombosis on your legs prior to surgery chances are you might get a pe and then that's something that they will look into it next time when you're upon recovery of your cab or probably side by side or you know they either treat your cab your cabbage first and recover you for that and then start your Hmm, heparin drip for your pulmonary embolism. So short of breath, often described um, ascribed to deconditioning, atelectasis, or anxiety. So that could probably delay your extubation. Leg discomfort attributed to the vein harvest. So yeah, the saphenous vein, that's where they're going to get your, you know, your vessels. So what you do is early ambulation, your SCDs, please, your SCDs needs to be on. They're all with the patient and the machine is on, right? Not just with the patient and the machine is off. That's not good. Um, and then your low molecular weight heparin, like your, your uh, Lovinox. Um, 
pneumonia, so that's why we would like for them to deep breathing exercises after extubation, because we've seen a lot of atelectasis and pneumonia, especially amongst our um, elderly patient, and now with COVID, what if they got COVID in the past, so that's going to be their history, right? So please be mindful with that. Bowel ischemia, because of your vasopressin, right? Your vasopressors, they're actually triggering mesenteric um, artery. They're, when you have, let's just say, vasopressin or levofed for a while, two days, three days, tendency is your mesenteric artery is being, you know, constricted and there's no blood flow to the gut and no blood, you know, bowel sounds, no BM, and the nurses don't report that. That is the reason why we have bowel ischemia. So low blood flow to the mesenteric artery due to your vasopressors. And of course, abdominal pain, no, no BM for a while. The nurses don't even care on asking when's the last BM. So I ask those guys. So those are my part of my assessment and my questions during report. So what do we do? We do abdominal surgery, uh, CT, and then see how how intense is the bowel, are the bowels involved. So please, please make sure you check those. Um, Non-surgical, we ambulate. That's why we need to extubate the patient and get them out of bed. Uh, NG tube to decompress, NPO, until we hear bowel sounds. Surgery, right? So tamponade. So a good, tam you know, the tamponade is something that I want the nurses to understand. I know from my experience that I always look for my ACV, right? A, C, V. So A, C, V. So, and then X descent, Y descent. Do you know that your CBP is a really important indicator of your um, cardiac tamponade? How? So this is what we, what we normally see. A, there is the abrupt, the V, and A. You lose the Y descent. Your X is really very prominent, like a drop. And the V will then go with just the A again. So if you see like a letter M like this, that is, and of course, your triad, you know, Beck's triad, right? Your muffled heart sounds, CVP is high, blood pressure is low, distant heart sounds, and then you do a chest x-ray. There is this widening mediastinum, and of course, heart rate is really elevated. Then you have to call the doctor. It's your cardiac tamponade. All right? So your equalization of your pressure, pressors, a uh, pressure. For example, your PA. Let's say your PAP. If, for example, um, thirty-five over twenty, and then your PAOP is twenty. So I think that is the equalization of your cardiac pressures. Pulses paradoxus in your art line. You see, um, what I see in the art line is like this. Especially if you're doing your ABG, you know, if you're not, if your hospital don't draw from the art line and you're just drawing it here, and then you're sensing like I feel the pulse and it's, I lost it, I'm feeling it, then I, it's gone again. So that's your pulsus paradoxus. Well, that is one of the thing that I see. But the pulsus paradoxus is when you put your blood pressure right, you hear that, then gone. So yeah. And then it all it has something to do with the breathing of the patient too. When they inhale, you hear it. When they exhale, you don't hear it. Something like that. There is your pulses paradoxes during expiration and inspiration. So normal respiratory variation during expiration is less than 10. And then during expiration is more than 10. So that is what we call pulses paradoxus. So what do you do? They do an echo or x-ray. They are 
I normally don't do it at the bedside. I would never entertain the idea of doing a cardio peri pericardiosynthesis. That's safe. It will bleed. So the patient needs to go back to OR. And if you do an open chest, then you do an open chest. Because uh, cardio pericardiosynthesis sometimes is it's just going to entertain the idea of bleeding, bleeding. So open chest procedure. Well, I had an experience with uh, with some surgeon in the past, and they, uh, for some reason, they wanted to do it pericardiosynthesis at the bedside, and we end up like bleeding and opening the chest. Yep, you have to be very careful with that. So what you do is check your chest tube. You can actually strip them. Um, well, they don't want us to milk it anymore, but just you know those, you have those tendency that you just rotor rotor it right. If there's a clot in there so that it would go into your chest tube and you know how much blood coming coming out from that chest tube and then of course your volume replacement your massive blood transfusion the whole nine yards you need to be ready so when infection a day or two and that's why we put a lot of those uh, assessment so open to air is a lot better because it heals faster but at the same time if it's open to air and they're eating and the food is all here and the nurse don't even care to wash or clean then the tendency is there's a bacterial exposure in there so infection so clean this guys with saline or peroxide so whatever the doctors order we normally just clean it with just one cleanser and then uh um, some some are putting some sort of like a betadine or um, antibiotic ointment. Cardiac arrest, you do your card, your you know whatever your CPR, your ACLS, and be ready. Okay. So emergency open chest. We your institution should have an annual. Uh, open chest training. We just got ours uh, last December and that's how you train and able to real see the situation if you have been up staffing to cover you know with an incident like that like how many nurses do you need at the bedside? What about the other patients that might be same situation like needing more observation, right? So is your unit well staffed enough that in the event that you have an open chest how many nurses that needs to be at the bedside so we reconsider that and we still have some challenges with our staffing which it's very ubiquitous anywhere else right so you need to have those open chest card line card your nurses role procedure and reporting nurses role means who's going to be the scrub nurse sterile nurse to hand me those you know spoon uh, defibrillator spoon things like that and who's going to be report do the reporting so I think that is pretty much your uh, some of your um, <clears throat> post of management in terms of um, wh what we discussed uh, volume pacemaker and pharmacology so now nursing care so you need to deline right day one some hospitals don't want to deline it, but ours is on our day one extubation up in the chair. And if everything goes well and stable, let's remove the PA catheter. Some discontinuing drips. Um, if you still have your diuresing or gold, especially pulmonary edema, those kind of things. So that's something that needs to be communicated. Daily weights is important. Uh, lab draws, x-ray daily, EKG daily pain management and medications, sternal precaution, like those, um, some hospitals, they do have those holders. Um, we're trying to order in our hospitals, but we're still in the process of ordering them. The heart hugger, right, your heart pillow. Uh, pacer wires capping. Um, again, guys, I don't know. Um, I'm still looking at my hospitals where we should have those properly um, pacer caps that we tape. We don't have that we just normally just you know leave them into the into the pacemaker you know holders nutrition activity chest shift that's a good thing about our hospital we do have physical therapy that's only take care of our CT patients 
she will he and she will get them out of the bed walk them in the around the unit um sometimes the nurses will will join them sometimes they just do it among themselves it's really great and then of course our chest tube removal we do have a, a pa um and np that are actually at the bedside 24 7 so they help us a lot with our chest tube removal just in case you don't have those uh, you don't have any um, extra help then you're you you as a CVICU nurse I think oh my god I don't know I mean where I came from I know that the PAs and the cardiothoracic surgeon are the ones who remove them if they do their rounding the next day they take them out and then we're just gonna check the the sites uh, wound care and, and, and dressing change especially the saphenous vein right the leg uh, the donor leg the donor site for the leg side most drips are weaned, weaned postoperatively and by the morning depending on the patient condition. So if they're young, they actually recover well. If, even if they're elderly, they recover well. So it's no longer a biggie now. Once drips are up, patient is stable, then you can actually uh, discontinue the line. So when you're removing PA catheter, make sure that the patient is on flat. I have seen nurses removing them while they're on the cardiac chair. No, don't do that because tendency is air, right? Air embolism. So um, have patient deep breath and hold the breath for a few seconds and then you pull it out. But they need to be flat, okay? Pull out gently, watch out for arrhythmia as a catheter will pass the right ventricle. And then of course, lay the patient in spine position, slightly Trendelenburg. Higher risk of air embolism due to the size of the introducer. And then you remove your sutures, put a line, you know, put pressure in there until there's no more bleeding, then get two by two and then take the, the transparent dressing, like a small one. It looks nice. And then you can see if the, if the neck is getting bigger or swollen, at least. Rather than those bulky dressing, you don't have the capacity to see what's going on. Examine the tip of your PA catheter, guys, and then that's how you do it. Your diuresing, start on POD number one. Again, it's a case-to-case -case basis. Some doctors would like to follow this, some doctors won't. And when to call the surgeon if the patient refuses to drink. So they were instructed to follow doctor's order, right? So make sure your INOs are completely um, charted. So some hospitals, the NP or even the PA are in the other rooms, but they're looking at all your charting. So if you're that nurse who will wait last minute chart, that's not good practice, guys. You need to chart real time. That's just my two cents. I have seen nurses, they will write it on a piece of paper, but not in the real chart. Like just chart it right there because a lot of people, a lot of our multidisciplinary team looking at your charting, looking at your data. So chart real time. I can stress that enough. Labs, check your K, check your mag. So the question is, if you have a mag of 1.2 and you have a K of 2.2, which one are you gonna replace first? If you're the nurse who said K, you're wrong. Don't do that. You use your mag first because magnesium, one of the effect or side effects of hypomagnesemia magnesemia, magnesemia right magnesium if your mag is low no matter what you do there is a refractory hypokalemia refractory that term refractory no matter how much potassium you're going to be putting in there if the mag remains low it would just say goodbye right it will just gonna secrete it out i don't know i think that's how i understood it since i was a big um many many years ago 30 years ago that was my one of my preceptor told me and that's what i have been doing since then so if i hear nurses saying like oh i'm gonna give my k first i was like okay well what about your mag the issue is some problem some hospitals they only do chem 7 right chem 7 like this your sodium your k your chloride your CO2, your BUN, and your creatinine here, and your glucose. Sometimes you don't have mag. So if your K is low here, the doctor said, go ahead and give 40K. Hey, as a critical thinker, you said, you know what, doc? 
We never checked magnesium yet. Why don't I add mag into the morning labs? That's a good thing to do. Do it. Because if your mag is low, replace that mag first before you act like this, uh, before you, you treat your potassium. I have a friend. She didn't listen to me. She kept, you know, she kept giving mag, oh, potassium. I think the whole eight hours, that's all she did. Because the K was like 60 mag, 60 milli equivalent. And you know, you, you can only give that every one hour, right? So we only work eight hours in that ICU. All her, I mean, all day, she's been giving potassium, 10, 10, 10, oh my God, because she doesn't have any central line. It's a very poor ICU. That's why I left there. I went somewhere else. You know, I mean, they, we call it work hard. You know, we, we try to work smart, not work hard, right? So that's just my two cents. You work smart, not work hard. And then the, cake, uh, the mag came back really low. No wonder why she was like, chasing the potassium all day long. And then the mag came back like 0 0.08, I think. So you need to check your mag first before you react or before you intervene. If the doctor said 20, give 20K, well, say, why don't you check mag first before you order? Because you don't know if the mag is low, right? right. Pay management, hydrocodone, oxycodone, ultram, toradol, Make sure you you know how to you know manage your pain, patient's pain, and then you do your PRN effectiveness, right? If you give me like morphine now after one hour, you chart what's going on with me. That's something that they check. So some of the medication, beta blockers, diuretics, and your insulin, insulin drip, you need to check that, guys. You need you you, you need to know your protocols. When when do you stop your insulin drip? when you convert it into sliding scale, right? Sternal precautions, your heart huggers, base wires, should not transfer patient in. I think this is case to case basis again. Some hospitals said that they don't want to transfer their patient to step down if the patient's still requiring pacing. But again, that's just a case to case basis. So nurses do not remove pacing wires. Why? Because of time for that or bleeding, I don't know, uh, we're not allowed to. So nutrition, chest tube removal, ambulization, I told you in my institution right now, four or five hours or even the next day, they walk. So again, these are your ambulation guidelines. So pulmonary care, wound care, your leg and your external incision, transition to home, right? So you should have the care coordination, um, transition to home again when you remove everything and tell them what to do, instruction-wise. So sometimes the telemetry or step-down ICU is going, going to do this for us. Okay. So that is the end of it. I hope that you guys learned something. But definitely, this is something that that's, uh, shouldn't intimidate you because when they came out, when they came out from OR, they have a lot of contraptions. They are attached to everything, and the family get really like afraid and scared because like, oh my God, he is really looks sick, and that's fine because as we are entering the, you know, the hours, like hour after hour, we are removing those, and he start waking up, and it gets better, and he feels better, and he looks better. All right, I hope you guys understood some of the, you know, it might not be the perfect one that you are looking for, but at least I gave you some of the basic that we do as a nurse, um, taking care of our open heart. And um, what I do is, as I've said, they are one-to-one, one-to-one -one, um, -one nursing ratio, right? You need to be there and you need to be monitoring, you need to be documenting, you need to be reporting real time. And if this is something that you need to uh, read some more, you have to do it. You just, because the more you do it, the more you get, gonna get better. Um, there's no such thing as you were born to take care of post cab. No, we've all been there. We started from beginning. We, we were probably did not understand at the beginning, but we did not quit. Instead, we look for more 
training and classes and suggestions and mentoring, coaching, those kind of things. Um, in order for us to be effective in caring for our patients, we really just have to understand the concept. Thank you very much.